Welcome to our presentation of the Subterranean 2.0 Cypher Suite. My name is Johan Dame and this is joint work with Pedro Maat Costa Massolino, Alireza Meerdaad and Jan Rotella. I will be doing the first part of the presentation, the historical part. And this history starts in 1992 with the publication of the original Subterranean. So I published it as a stream hash module and it is something that looks like this. And you can use it in two ways. <coughs> you can use it as to compute a, a hash function. So you can compute a hash over a variable length message uh, and get a fixed length hash. And you can use it to compute a key stream for a, from a fixed length key and a fixed length diversifier. And the way this works is very close to what you would do with a sponge. We absorb here in blocks of 32 bits, <coughs> where we each cycle we shift in 32 bits into the shift register and they shift out back here again. So uh, uh, a 32-bit block stays in the, in the machine for eight cycles. While doing that, we also update a state that is initialized to zero, and then we update it each iteration by applying this round function that I will explain on the next slide. So after everything has been absorbed, we do a number of blind rounds for, uh, to get some nonlinearity and mixing. And from then on, we start squeezing. <coughs> so every uh, cycle, we can squeeze 16 bits. Um, so for instance, if you here want a hash of 256 bits, we have to iterate 16 times. So that's the way it worked. Let's now take a closer look at this round function. So our shift register is 256 bits. And our state is 257 bits. Um, and the round function is depicted here. So you can see, for instance, here this bit 92 of the state, how it depends on the bits of the state one cycle earlier. So at time t. So you see that it's actually uh, a function of nine bits. Uh, and this is implemented in two layers a mixing layer here, where each output bit depends on three input bits, and a nonlinear layer where we have something that closely resembles C from Ketchakev, with the only difference that here we um, operate on a cycle of 257 bits rather than cycles of 5 bits, and also that we have a complement, but this is a detail. Uh, so for the rest we see also that there is a buffer injection here, so uh, the, the shift register bits are injected here, uh, with the exception of here. So that accounts for the difference in state size between A and B. And we do a flip of the bit at position zero to get rid of the symmetry properties. So you can see that if you compute, the computation of this bit depends on these bits. And if you then uh, go one cycle up, we move this here. And we see that these uh, nine bits, they will be put in positions 12 bits apart, so nine consecutive bits, and they will then again be depending on non-overlapping bits. So you get a quite good uh, spreading of uh, information. So I published this in 92, but there was never much reaction, and I still think it was a nice design. So we were thinking, why not try to get some attention to Subterranean by submitting it to the light NIST lightweight competition? So it was not really meant as lightweight at the time. Look, for instance, at the chaining value in the hash mode is a 250-bit chaining value, while then uh, current hash functions like MD4 and MD5, they had a 128-bit chaining value. So it was not meant to be lightweight, it was meant to be more secure than existing solutions. Also, this round function is really hardware-oriented and not suited for software. But that would not be a problem because we would go for low energy, and low energy implies ASIC anyway. So would it be really low energy? Well, a round function takes four XOR gates, one NAND gate and one NOT gate to execute per bit and is shallow. So that's quite good for low energy. So few operations and not too high gate delay. If you look at absorbing, we absorb 32 bits per round and taking into account the size of the state, this accounts for 32 XORs, eight NANDs and eight NOT operations per bit absorbed. Squeezing is twice as expensive, but still reasonably uh, cheap if you compare it to so-called lightweight designs that are now being proposed. So we thought, let's give it a shot. So we decided to um, refurbish <coughs> Subterranean 
to subterranean two dot zero. So first we got rid of the sub hash and substream, and we uh, aimed for three different primitives that are more modern: a zof like uh, the shake function, so variable length input, variable length output; a deck function, which is basically a keyed zof, which is more efficient than a zof, and it also allows you to build a lot of different, uh, very interesting modes. And then a dedicated SAE mode. Uh, there's nothing we can not do with a deck mode that we can do with SAE, but SAE is much more compact. So you can build a more compact solution, and that was very interesting in the context of the NIST lightweight competition. So we built this primitive by refactoring subterranean in two levels. So subterranean 2.0 has two levels, a duplex level and a mode level. At duplex level, we um, <clears throat> harmonized the rate to 32 in squeezing and keyed absorbing. We still had the different rate for the unkeyed absorbing, uh, where we had to reduce to 8 bits per 2 rounds, so 8 times slower, but that we had to do because the difference between the state size and the security and the uh, required security was too small. So we want to achieve the 112, 112 bits of security that NIST required. We got rid of the shift register B altogether and we just absorb in the state A or squeeze from the state A in an intelligent way. But Jan will tell you about that in a moment. At mode level, we always have eight blank rounds between absorbing and squeezing, <coughs> except <coughs> for the encryption and decryption operation in SAE, and there we rely on non uniqueness So now Jan will now uh, go on about the uh, rationale behind Subterranean 2.0 and also the details of the uh, design. As already highlighted by Johan, Subterranean 2.0 comes with a XOF, a DEC, and a session authenticated encryption scheme. Let's now describe those three modes. The XOF can be used for hashing and works as follows. The absorption phase splits the possible multiple strings that we want to absorb into byte blocks. Between each absorbed block of message, we apply two times the run function R. Once the strings are absorbed, we apply eight blank ones. The squeezing phase then produces a string of arbitrary length where every output block has a length of 32 bits as maximum. For clean mode, we let the absorption rate to be the same as the squeezing phase, four bytes at maximum, as padding rule allows us to process any arbitrary length strings. Also, we apply one round, only one round between each absorption. Then, the subterranean deck works as follows. Cut the key into blocks of maximum 32 bits, absorb the key, cut the public string represented here by M also into blocks of length 4 bytes or shorter, apply 8 blank runs, and then produce the output that can serve, for instance, as a Mac. Subterranean 2.0 comes also with a session authenticated encryption scheme that works as follows. Every input and output strings are separated into blocks of length 32 bits at maximum. The scheme is duplex-like. We first absorb the key and the nonce for initialization. We apply the run function eight times, then we absorb the associated data. Before absorbing any plain text block, 32 bits or less are squeezed and those serve as key stream to produce the cipher text by XORing plain text P to accord in key stream Z. After applying again eight blank rounds, the tag can be produced the same way as in the XOF or deck mode. Hence, a new message can be processed in the same session. The run function R looks as follows. It is composed of four mappings. The well-known key mapping for nonlinearity, a bit complementation at position zero to break the symmetries, a theta function that is a mixed layer mapping that, can, that here to serve diffusion, followed by a P mapping for dispersion, which is a bit shuffle mapping. More precisely, in this P mapping, output bit zero is input bit zero, output bit one is input bit 12, output bit two is input bit 24, and so on by taking all indices modulo 257. Note here that 12 is a generator of the multiplicative group Z over 257Z star. Let's now see how bits are absorbed and squeezed in the ZOF, DEG, and SAE modes. The main point here is that we do not take consecutive state bits 
to define the outer part of the state. The factor 12 used in the P mapping is a generator of the multiplicative group Z over 257Z star, and hence its powers covers all 256 non-zero bit indices. Hence, 12 to the power 4 covers 64 of these positions. This defines a multiplicative subgroup G64. Then, the squeeze operation outputs 32 bits that are computed by the XOR of two state bits, where the indices are inverse from each other in the subgroup G64. So, every keystream bit is the sum of two particular state bits. Eventually, the absorb operation is simpler, and the input bits are XORed into the state bits at all positions defined by the first element of G64, where the elements of G64 are ordered by the consecutive power of 176, that is to 12 to the power 4. We choose non-consecutive bits in the absorbing and squeezing phase. We squeeze from non-consecutive bits and we absorb into non-consecutive bits. If we had chosen consecutive state bits to absorb and squeeze, then an attacker could partially compute the key mapping with the knowledge of the key stream. This effect has been observed by Thomas Fur, Maria Naya Placencia and Malsef in 2018 on the first version of Ketua Jr. And the choice has been made in this direction. The fact that the key stream is defined as a sum of two state bits also frustrates cryptanalysis. Moreover, this particular choice is also consistent with the shuffle layer, the P mapping. The important of our design choices are the number of rounds, which shows eight rounds for separation. For the unkin mode, a security analysis present in the paper that I will not detail here explains why we chose two rounds between each absorbed block. A padding rule allows arbitrary length bit strings. This for all subterranean modes. Hence, the absorbing rate is 8 bits plus 1 bit of padding. Hence, we want security in the case where an attacker has exactly 9 bits of, in of freedom per input blocks. The same also holds for the key mode, where the effective absorbing rate can be considered as 33 bits, but where there is, in this case, only one round between each block. Up to now, two third-party cryptanalyses have been published on Subterranean 2.0. The first one comes from Fukang Liu, Takanori Isobe, and Willy Mayer, where they looked into Subterranean SAE into non smissius scenario. Even though Subterranean is not designed to be non smissius resistant. Moreover, they were able to attack Subterranean by using a cube-based approach, when the separator is reduced to four rounds. The key recovery complexity is 2 to the power 122 calls to Subterranean, and the distinguisher has a complexity of 2 to the power 32 calls to Subterranean. The second one, cryptanalysis, has been done by Ling Song, Yi Tu, Don Ping Shi, and Lei Hu, and it is available on ePrint. In their work, the author proposed size reduced versions to help further investigations. They also prove that there is no observable linear biases in the key stream when taking four consecutive output blocks. And they also improve the complexity of the non misuse cryptanalysis. To conclude my part, I will say that we believe that the security of subterranean is still strong, but naturally, we solely encourage all cryptanalysts to target subterranean. So more cryptanalysis is welcome. But now me announce Ali Reza that will talk about differential trail analysis of subterranean. Now I want to talk about the resistance of subterraneans against differential attack. The main idea of differential cryptanalysis is to find pairs of input like M0 and M1 with a specific difference delta 0 that leads to a specific difference at the output delta R with a high probability. Then we can say that the security of this algorithm against differential attack is at most equal to the maximum differential probability of delta 0 goes to delta R. 
but it is hard to determine. We believe that for Soterranean, the maximum DP is, e is approximately equal to the maximum DP of QR. When QR is a differential trail, and you can show this trail like this, when BIs are intermediate differences. If you want to show this trail on the figure, you can show it this way. To make it easier, we use the weight of trail instead of DP, but this, these can be easily converted to each other. The weight is equal to the negative log 2 of DP. This is what we have so far. To calculate the weight of this trail, we need to define differential trail core. Each round function of subterraneans consists of two layers, linear and nonlinear. We call linear layer lambda, and chi is the nonlinear layer. So we can divide each round into these two layers. We denote by ai the difference after each chi layer. Since lambdas are linear layers, once we got the value of ai, we can compute the value of bi with probability equal to 1. So the weight of this trail only depends on the weight of passing chi, which is equal to the weight of delta 0 goes to a1 here, and bi's go to ai plus 1s. Or we can simply show it this way. Minimum reverse weight of a1 plus weight of bi's. Knowing the input difference is enough to compute the weight. So we can show this part like this. But why did we use minimum reverse weight for A1? Well, the output difference A1 is compatible with a lot of difference at the input delta zeros. And since we are looking for the lower bound on the weight, we use the minimum reverse weight here. Now we want to know what is the lower bound on the weight of differential trails. Well, it's hard to determine this lower bound for big trails, like eight or seven rounds. But the thing we can do is to start with smaller trails. This is obvious that the weight is two for one round and, two, and eight for two, round, two rounds. But it is not trivial for three rounds or more. To find the lower bound on the weight of three round trail cores, we generated all of this trail core cores up to weight 39. For this purpose, we use the same method as introduced by Mela, Diamond, and Vanash in 2016. This is the list of all three round trail cores up to weight 39. The numbers are modular rotation. This means that for this particular weight, since the length of the state of subterranean is 257, we have 1 times 257 trails with weight 25. So the lower bound on the weight of 3 rounds tray cores is 25. And this is how it looks like. You have 1 active bit at A1, two, 3 active bits at B1 and 9 active bits at B2. I also listed the positions of the active bits here. To find the lower bound on the weight of four round differential trail cores, we search the space of all trails up to weight 48. But there was no four round trails up to this weight. The best four round trail cores we found cost 58. So the minimum weight of a four round tray course should be somewhere between 49 and 58. This is the four round tray course with weight 58 that we found. We have nine active bits at, the, at A1, five active bits at B1, six active bits at B2, and 15 active bits at B3. So far, we found the lower bound on the weight of 1, 2, and 3 round tray cores, 
and we know that the lower bound on the weight of four round records is somewhere between 49 and 58. But what can we do to find the lower bound on the weight of eight round records? Well, we know that each eight round trail core Q8 can be divided into four into two four round trail cores Q4 and Q prime four. If this trail wants to have weights smaller than or equal to 97, then one of these four round trail cores should cost smaller than or equal to 48. Since there is no four round track was up to this weight, then we can conclude that the weight of eight round track is 98, which is 97 plus one. We use different met methods to find the lower bound on the weight of other trail cores which I will not go into detail, but you can see the list of these lower bounds in this table. Now let's talk about implementation and performance. Since Subterranean 2.0 is a software optimized for hardware, we only talk about the hardware results. We won't talk about the software results nor the software implementation. So here we have the full AED circuit that's compatible with the hardware LWC API. Our goal for this architecture was high throughput, which is one of the outstanding features of the subterranean permutation. To obtain high throughput, we made a circuit called the subterranean stream, which can perform AAD or hash as long as data arrives in a specific order and data is sent in full 32 bits of blocks, except for the last block, which has to be also flagged as being last. And around this streaming circuit, we built the circuit that's compliant with the LWC API. This is the same strategy we uh, used by the LWC API um, people who did the framework and who did the proposal. However, our solution is tuned, optimized for subterranean um, itself. And to control this entire circuit, we made a big state machine that controls all these LWC API related messages. However, subterranean stream itself has its own internal state machine. So I could do my own benchmarking. Instead of doing my own benchmark, I'm going to get the results for third part benchmarks. So the people who proposed the framework, the API, uh, they also did the benchmark in terms of FPGA. So for FPGAs, uh, specifically the RTX 7 from Xilinx, Subterranean is the first one in terms of encryption. So in terms of throughput, and the sixth place in terms of hashing throughput. So this is not very surprising, exactly because in during the construction of Subterranean, the proposal of Subterranean, so the theoretical part of Subterranean, Subterranean can process 32 bits of data per round during, the, during encryption, while other ciphers like AES process 128 bits of data every 10 rounds, Zodiac uh, process 16 bits of data Per round. You can see here that it's a lot of lots of data per round compared to other ciphers. Of course, to do a full comparison, a better comparison, I would need to uh, compare how much it round costs. However, I can easily say that subterranean round is very cheap and therefore most likely that's the main reason why we get really in the first place also really high throughput. The same thing applies for hashing. Subterranean um, process 4 bits per data for hashing mode. Therefore, you can easily see the difference between the 6 gigabits per second to 744 megabits per second. However, all of these solutions, both these solutions are in the same hardware, so the same hardware supports hashing and encryption. Therefore, we get very low amount of lookup tables, so only 915. In terms of ASIC, we also get the first place and however and also for energy we get the first place for throughput and the first place for energy and while the throughput are already explained before energy is uh, a little bit more special exactly because we already proposed that we are have a very low amount of energy cipher and this is it can be explained by two things so subterranean is a cipher that can process lots of data for a very small amount of rounds 
So they can say, think of, a, for a big set of data, I need less rounds, so less time. And as a consequence, we also, our rounds are very cheap, so you need less resources for each round. If you need less resources, that means less power, less power, less time, therefore very less energy. So that's w the reason why we are very cheap energy solution. So to conclude, as I already said, Subterranean can target the securities of 120 bits for DEC and Psy, and 112 for XOF. Uh, we have a very comfortable safety margin, as seen by other third-party crypto analysis, but we need you to do more crypto analysis. So please do crypto analysis of Subterranean. It's a very good cipher. And it's also a lightweight cipher, as I already said, by very small state size, very low amount of, of rounds and uh, that you need to absorb. And all of this has been confirmed by the benchmarking. And also for in terms of masking, um, we the non-linear layer is only an end gate, therefore it should be easy to mask just one end gate. And thank you very much for your attention.